All right, guys. Well, let's get this thing going. Um, it's 4.05 right now, and I've got four viewers. I had five for a second, so there's a few of you out there. Um, can you see the question box? Because um, I need to be able to chat with you guys, or I need you to be able to like talk to me. Because if uh, you can't talk to me, it's pretty much just like, I mean, I could have just recorded a video and sent it to you. But the cool thing about this is that you get to interact with me so and type me questions and comment about what I'm saying and things like that. So if you could, all right, let me know. Is there any, because right now I have these buttons on the side of my screen. I have a Q&A button, which I've got popped up right now. And then I have this little chat window too. And so um, I've got Q&A popped up right now. If that's working like if you can see something on your screen that says ask a question or something like that just like type in any question like why are stars white or what is your name just to see um, if it works okay and we'll do we'll try that for like a minute and then after that then I'm gonna switch to the chat window and see if that works too and then uh, fall as well and we can like communicate with each other um, I'll start and I've got all my notes I'm ready to rock to review with you guys so stay tuned um see if you can ask a question and while you're doing that i guess i'll just uh post a picture of some of the stuff i did this morning because it was fun it's like four or five inches of snow it's awesome all right so I uh, went outside and I was like, I'm going to shovel my driveway because I haven't had to do it in like 10 years. And I grew up in Michigan and we had to shovel our driveway like all the time. So, uh, yeah, this is a picture of me and my awesome shovel. You know, in Michigan, we have like huge snow shovels. And so I like went out of my garage. And I'm like, how am I going to shovel my driveway? This is going to be really hard. Um, but I did it with this tiny shovel. It took me like 30 or 45 minutes and it was super fun. And then, this way, then I shoveled the whole thing, and this is what my front yard looked like. Pretty crazy. But that was how much snow was there this morning, and now obviously there's like nothing there. It's like all melted pretty much. So crazy things in Texas. You get a bunch of snow, and it just disappears in like one day. Okay, well, it looks to me that there are, you know, no questions popping. Oh, okay. Thanks, Dylan. Dylan says we have to stop watching the video to ask questions. That is not good. All right. Can you still hear me, though, when you ask questions? Let me just switch to, uh, I'm going to switch to the chat option and see what that does. All right, so now I've switched over to chat and uh, see if there's like a little chat window or something that pops up. I just need a way to chat with you guys while we're presenting. Any luck on the chat window? It's showing up on my screen. It's like right here, but I don't know if it's going to work on the iPad for you guys. I guess if this doesn't work, we could just chat on Edmodo. Like if you guys had questions, you could just post them there. We could get like a, a thread going, and that would work pretty well. But then you'd have to like switch back to that app and then come back again. 
probably be best just to watch it on computer. Or I can just talk for 30 minutes. I mean, <laughs> kind of want to interact with you guys, though. I think that would be the best, the best way to do it. All right, guys. Um, oh, thanks, McGuire. Glad you can hear me. <laughs> All right, we may have to, uh, I think maybe the best way to do this is just to, if you guys have any specific questions, just to type them out on Edmodo. Um, that post that I posted with the link to the Snow Day review, um, that would probably be the best post to put it on. Just click reply on that post. Uh, or just type a reply. Uh, every time you guys have a question or something, just type a reply on that, and I will periodic check, periodically check that as I go through the review, okay? And uh, I don't know, this probably will take like maybe 15 minutes um, to get through. I don't think it's gonna take super long, but we'll see. I don't know, I never really know until we start. So um, feel free as we go through this, if you have any questions about anything, um, hit me up, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Let's do this thing. All right, so the first part of the study guide is just just vocab, all right? Uh, I posted a link to Nassant's Quizlet deck that he made for us, so thanks, Nassant, you're awesome. Um, just go to Quizlet, click on that link, check it out. I mean, run through the learn phase of it. I mean, there's a, oh, let me just like share that with you. Let me show you what that looks like. Because Quizlet is just awesome, really good, really good. All right, let me show you this. Okay, so Quizlet has all these different things. Once you actually get in the deck, um, when you go up to the top, there's flashcards that you can flip through. There's this learn phase that gives you like fill in the blank stuff. Um, and then there's a test you can do. And the test actually makes different, it takes the vocab and it makes either a multiple choice test or uh, true false questions. It just, it does a really good job of mixing everything up to kind of see if you really know it. And then once you get really good at it, then you should try out like the space race. And the space race is actually kind of fun. I just played it yesterday where it takes um, the vocab, it takes the like definition, and it makes it go across the screen. And uh, you only have a certain amount of time to type the answer. And if you type the answer in the right amount of time, then you win, it's awesome. So um, definitely check out Quizlet, run through the vocab cards two, three times till you like feel like you're really, you've mastered it, and then do the space race thing just for fun. Um, and you should be good to go on the vocab side of things. 
Oops, I wasn't showing any of that to you. <laughs> um, okay, I had to click one more button. That's hilarious. So what I was just saying is all up on the top here in Quizlet. You got flashcards, learn, and then that test thing where it puts everything into questions is right here, and then the space race, which is super fun. So it will look different on your iPad. This is a computer, but it will look different on your iPad. I'm guessing there are the same kind of things that you can do. Okay, so boom. Let's go back to study guide. All right, so next thing in the study guide we had were the objectives from the videos and from that one section in the book that we read. OK, so first off, explain how matter is created or is not created or destroyed in chemical reactions. Um, for that part, I would just use examples to explain that. Um, you can just say that matter is not created or destroyed, but it really doesn't make sense until you use an example. So for example, um, if, you, if we did that lab, remember back to the lab of conservation of mass when we took some baking soda and we mixed it with some vinegar inside of a flask, but we put it all inside a closed system. We put the balloon on top of it so nothing could escape. So we really carried out that reaction in a closed container so like nothing could escape. And you saw the reaction happen. You saw the gas bubbles being formed. Um, you weighed everything before the reaction uh, and then wrote down that number. And then you weighed everything after all the fizzing and all the reaction had stopped. And you weighed it again. And you found that the mass was pretty much the same. All right. And that was to sort of demonstrate the law of conservation of mass. And so I guess I would just use um, examples like that. Um, you could even talk about how when you um, light something on fire or whatever, that wood that you start with and the oxygen that's needed for the fire, if you were to actually put that on a scale and weigh it, um, that the mass of what you start with would equal the mass of everything that's produced. So like if you were to burn it and it turned into ash and smoke and uh, anything else, if you were to weigh all of the products and compare that mass to what you started with, it would be exactly the same. All right, and that's what the law of conservation of mass is saying is that, or that's how you explain that matter is not created or destroyed. Okay, the law of conservation of mass is one thing, but to explain it, you kind of have to use examples. Okay, second thing, um, distinguish between a physical change and a chemical change. Um, it's pretty easy. A, a physical change is just a change in appearance. Um, it doesn't actually change the identity of the substance. Okay, so like um, if you were to I don't know, like saw something in half, or if you were to, I don't know, just boil water. I mean, if you boil water and it turns into steam, it's still water. Like steam is still H2O. You haven't changed the chemical composition of it. Even though it looks like chemistry, it looks really, uh, you know, it looks kind of fancy, but it's really not. Nothing big is happening. It's just changing into a different phase of matter. It's not changing into something else. Um, chemical changes, on the other hand, are when uh, the substance completely changes into something else. So, you know, if you start with wood and it turns into ash and smoke, obviously those are two completely different things. And so that is definitely a chemical change. All right. Check in moto here. All right. Oh, Jake can't get on. Bummer. I'm going to write him a note. You try on a computer. Good luck, Jake. All right, next one. Um, explain how four different physical properties can uh, be used to clean wheat to make flour. If you guys want to review that one, just go back to the video on um, making flour. I took you through a tour of my dad's flour mill and kind of how that whole process works. I think the best thing to do for that one is just rewatch that video. It's like seven, eight minutes, really interesting. Skip the parts you know, but then there's four properties. Um, and it was density. Um, was with like the fan and blew away the chaff. Um, the size, um, a screen was used to kind of separate out all the, the small pieces from the wheat kernels. And then the color sorting machine used the property of color to separate all the um, things that weren't the color of the wheat kernel from the wheat kernels. And then magnetism, there was a big electromagnet that sucked out all the metal pieces. So if you want to see that again, just watch that video. And this last objective here, um, you don't really need to, uh, I mean, this is just, this kind of ties in with the vocab on the top. All right, all these physical properties, just know what they are, OK? 
Okay. And if you have any questions about those, just let me know. But honestly, you can just Google each one of these terms or just go to Quizlet and you'll be all set to go. Okay. So um, next thing, I prepared a little document for you guys to help you help you out with all these skills right here. So we're going to transition to that document instead and uh, hope you guys uh, and help you guys figure these things out. All right. So one of the things you're going to need to do on the test is I'm going to give you some reactions. I'm going to give you some compounds. And you're going to have to count atoms. And really, the law of conservation of mass, you can't look at a chemical equation and figure out if it follows that law unless you can count atoms. And if you can't look at a compound and know how many things are in it or how many atoms are in it, you're gonna lose, you're gonna miss the question. So um, that's well, I've been I did it again. I have to click two buttons to share my screen with you instead of one and it messed me up again. So I've been like looking at the study guide and like highlighting things like this. <laughs> All right, this is fun. This is good learning for me too. Okay, here we go. Let's share a different document and actually share it this time. All right, so it's this one. Bingo. Present to everyone. Yes, I would like to present to everyone. Perfect. Okay, there we go. Just a second. There we are. Okay, so first one. H2O. Um, this goes into the difference between subscripts and coefficients, but anytime you see a subscript like that, it's kind of like a little bit below the line, like a submarine subscript. Um, that gives you the number of that atom. So this two means that there are two hydrogens. And then oxygen, how many oxygens do you think there are? Two? Mm. One? Yeah, it's actually just one, okay? If there's no subscript right next to it, like on the right side of it, it means there's just one of them. And so you just write the symbol, it's assumed, it's just one, and you're good to go. So H2O is two hydrogens, one oxygen. This could be any any combination of elements. It could be S2O or F2O. I mean, just understand those numbers are that's the number of atoms for that specific atom. All right, then we get like a little bit more complicated and you start throwing more numbers in. And let's just like ignore this four for a second. And just look at this. Like the question on the study guide was how many hydrogen atoms are in 4H2SO3? Well, looking at just this right now, H2SO3, there's just two hydrogens right here. Okay. But this coefficient means that there are four of this entire molecule. There's four of them. So if there are four of these, it's almost like I would write, I don't know, let's just, I could probably like copy this. Let's see if this works. Yeah, it does. Okay, perfect. Move this up. Back to H2SO4. Make it smaller so I don't like lose the page too. I think you guys see where I'm going with this. Okay, so this up here is exactly the same as this right here. Okay, it's just written in a different way. So when you see it this way, you understand that there's two here, there's two hydrogens here, two here, and two here. So all together, you have eight hydrogens. So just make sure you know what that coefficient thing means because uh, if you don't understand that it means four of that entire atom, you're gonna get it wrong. You're gonna like look at, for example, like what I said, um, what if I asked you how many oxygen atoms are in this? Without this down here, you might think, oh, well, four, and then four. A lot of students will just add those things. Okay, so you got to make sure you don't just add four plus four because that's not the answer. It's four. It's four times four. There's four of those atoms, so it's actually sixteen oxygens. Okay. All right. Next one. All right. What if you got something like this? All right. This is where you need to be careful. Um, if you're one of those people that takes a test and you kind of rush through it and uh, you think you know the answer and you just like quick look at that answer really quick, you fill it in and you don't look at the whole thing, you might miss this. And so if you see, if I say how many um, atoms of oxygen are in the products and these are the products right here well if, if I say that um, you have to look at both look at look at all the products not just one so for example like right here we know there's 16 oxygens here on this side but then if we miss this one right here we're gonna get wrong and I guarantee you that whoever your teacher is all right including me I'm gonna put 16 as one of the options 
I'm going to put 17 as one of the options and then probably 18 and 19 or something like that just to fill in the other two. And so um, the answer here is you have 16 oxygens here and then one more right here. So in this whole thing, there are 17 oxygen atoms. Okay. And then let's just do one more. All right. Notice the difference between this one and the last one is that there's now a coefficient here on the second thing. So you have um, 16 oxygens here. If I was asking how many oxygens are in this in the products here, there would be 16 here, and then there would be another two right here because of this coefficient of two. It means there's two molecules of H2O. All right. So that's how that one works. So that's the first skill you need to know is you need to know how to count atoms and just be take your time be detailed you won't make any mistakes on that all right and then the next skill all right you have to know you have to be able to evaluate models of chemical equations to see if they obey the law of conservation of mass and so law of conservation of mass says that matter can't be created or destroyed can't be created or destroyed so when you look at an equation like this you got to think well this is what i start with those are called the reactants. And then these are the things that are made. These are the products. If I start with like, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. If I start with 14 oxygens, I better end up with 14 oxygens in the end. If I don't, that chemical equation is wrong. I haven't written it correctly. Or whoever has written it hasn't written it correctly. And so um, what you need to do is just count atoms. All right. You just have to count them. And so in this side over here, let's just do the carbons first and see what we've got. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. We've got six carbons in the reactants. And then in the products, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So you got six carbons in the products too. So we're good. All right, there's six in, on each side. So we haven't created or destroyed any carbon. But then let's look at the hydrogens here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. We have 16 hydrogens. And then over here, our cute little Mickey Mouse water molecules. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's only 10. So that's wrong. All right. This would not uh, follow the law of conservation of mass because we've destroyed hydrogen. Like, where did that extra hydrogen go? Like, I mean, we had a whole bunch over here, and there's definitely not as much over here. There's not as many atoms. So, your answer would, for that would be like, no, it does not follow the law of conservation of mass. But then you would have to defend yourself. You'd have to explain it more. So then say, for example, there's no, um, there are this many hydrogens over here, and we actually lost them. There's actually not as many on, in the products, okay? Use words like reactants, use words like product, or use the word products, and uh, you should be good to go on things like that. And I, I could pick any reaction, guys. I mean, this is the combustion of propane. That's what a propane molecule looks like when it mixes with oxygen and you have a little heat, you get fire. But uh, it can be any range of compounds, but you just have to count the atoms. Just look at the atoms and you'll be good to go. All right. And then you might get some that are um, not actually like models, but they're um, just equations like this, or it's an equation for you. And in this case, you do the same thing, but you just count atoms. So on this side, you just look at how many carbons there are. So there's three. And then on the right side, there's only one. So again, mass was destroyed. We've lost carbon atoms. So if I asked you, does this follow the law of conservation of mass? You would say, no, it doesn't. It's wrong. Because you started with three and you only ended with one. Okay, let's do one more. And we'll move on to the next concept. All right, you guys are great. Let me see if you have any questions. Mm. All right, cool. Jackson, I see you, man. I see your question. I'll get to that right after I do this one, okay? And then problems about the iodine lab. Yes, McGuire, there will be. And I'll explain that too. That actually, I'll get to that in my one of my examples here. All right. So this one here. All right, let's look at it. Does this equation follow the law of conservation of mass? Let's look at the hydrogens first, because that's the first element. We've got two hydrogens on this side. And then, oh, just kidding. We have more than two, almost tricked myself. So see this coefficient here? It means there's two NaOH molecules. So there's one in the molecule, but since we have two of these molecules, there's gonna be two hydrogens here and two here. So we have four on this side, and then over here, we only have two. So mass was actually destroyed. Um, this one doesn't follow it either. 
All right, if it actually did follow it, you guys would just see equal numbers of each atom on each side and you'd be good to go. All right. All right, let's jump back over to, let's see. Yeah, this would be good for McGuire's question, probably. And Jackson, let's see. All right. Let's get to Jackson's question first. I'm going to pause for a second and jump to Jackson's question. All right, let me transition back to the study guide so I can figure out what that question is. There we go. All right, question number four. All right. Okay, good question. Um, <laughs> I wrote it. Uh, dissolving anything into water is a physical change. How could this change be reversed? Dissolving anything into water is a physical change. How could this change be reversed? Well, just think about it. Um, if you dissolve something into water, like let's say you dissolve salt into water, um, it becomes kind of part of the solution. I mean, it's still salt, but if you want to get rid of the water, you got to think like, okay, how uh, is water different than salt? How is water different than salt? Just think of physical properties. How is it different? You might be thinking um, its color is obviously different, like white and clear, you know, but unfortunately when it dissolves in the water, like you can't see the difference. So that's not going to actually work for you. Um, think of a different property. Just go through all the properties in your head. Think, um, you know, think solubility, think color, density, think melting point, boiling point. Oh, boiling point. All right. That's the key. All right. Is boiling point. Um, or actually, yeah, boiling point would be perfect. So you got to like think of which property is different between them because if you can figure out which one's different, then you might be able to utilize it to separate them. So boiling point is the one you can use because if you heat up the salt water and you get it up to like 100 degrees Celsius, the water is going to boil, but the salt won't because salt, I mean, just think about it. If you were to like put just like a whole pot full of salt on the burner, like nothing's going to happen for a really long time. I mean, like you cannot boil salt on a burner, but you can boil water. So if you have salt water, you just boil the water and the water will eventually boil away and you'd be left with just salt. Okay. And if you really wanted to collect the steam, you could run it through. Um, that was in one of my videos. You can kind of collect the steam and then run it through something cold. And when it drops below its boiling point again, it'll turn back into water. So. Anyway, that's number four. Let me transition back to, and guys, I'm welcome. I, I'm, I can answer probably like one or two more questions on the questions if you guys want to. So feel free to post more questions about the actual 10 questions. Since you guys are tuned in today, um, I will happily give you some of the answers on that. Happily. All right, transitioning back to the study guide. Or back to the, yeah, I was already there. Okay, so, um, all right, so the next one, or the next skill was identifying physical and chemical properties of various substances. Okay, and in that one, I might just give you um, something, all right? Like the question in here is, Compare and contrast two physical properties of apples and oranges. I might just give you something like, give me three physical properties of a carton of milk. And this is just testing to see if you really know what physical properties are, okay? Uh, a carton of milk, just think about it, okay? Color, um, it's white usually, and it has, I don't know, like red or blue ink on it. Okay, that's a physical property. Um, what's its state of matter, a carton of milk? Um, it's a uh, solid and it contains liquid, okay? that's a physical property. You could do viscosity. Um, what's the viscosity of milk? Well, is it thick? No, it's really thin. So it has a low viscosity. All right. So you would describe it as being like a low viscosity. Um, and then boiling point, melting point. I mean, sure, you could like cite those. I obviously don't have that memorized in my head, and neither do you. I don't expect you to, but you could mention that. You could say it has a boiling point, it has a melting point, and I'd be fine with that. 
So um, that's what I mean for that question is just, I want you to like be able to look at things like we did in labs and just tell me what the physical properties are. All right. All right, next one. Um, analyze scenarios in which a change has occurred and determine if it was a physical or a chemical change. Now, in this case, um, you have to just kind of question yourself. You question the scenario. If, uh, if I say sugar is dissolved in water, okay, sugar dissolved in water is still sugar. It hasn't chemically changed, all right? It just looks a little different. Anytime you dissolve something in water, um, it's not actually chemically changing. Um, it's still the same things. Now, if I take a piece of paper and I light it on fire, obviously that's a chemical change because I started with like white paper and um, I ended up with like black ash and smoke and all kinds of other things. So that's obviously a chemical change. Um, if I uh, mix red paint and white paint and I get pink paint, um, is that a chemical change or a physical change? So it's kind of like tricky because like I taught you guys that a color change is a chemical change, but it doesn't always have to be, okay? Like sometimes you might mix together different colors of things and they make a new color, but it didn't actually change chemically. Now in the lab that you guys did with the iodine, when you mixed like iodine, that yellow stuff, in with cornstarch, remember what color it changed? It was like purple, it's like black. I mean, that was like an obvious chemical reaction. Like that black stuff was not there before, you know? And so when the color change is really obvious like that, you know it's a, a chemical change. You know that something new has been formed. So you kind of have to just ask yourself, okay, is, is what just happened, did something new get created? If something brand new got made, if there's a new substance formed, you know it's a chemical change. But if it just kind of changed appearance or it, it just kind of like changed the state of matter, like water boiling, it looks really chemical because it's like boiling and you see bubbles, but bubbles doesn't always equate chemical change. I mean, it's, it's just changing from liquid to gas. It's still H2O. But if you mix vinegar and baking soda together, um, you get this like fizzing. It's like a violent fizzing. You know something new is made. So that's kind of how you, you just have to kind of whatever situation I throw at you guys, you just have to ask yourself, okay, what just happened and were any new substances made? Is there any evidence of new substances? Usually the evidence is a really extreme color, color change. Um, gases are given off. You might get like an odor because of that gas. It might smell kind of funny. Um, or you might get some heat given off. Like when I did um, any kind of combustion reaction is chemical. So if you see a combustion reaction, game on. That one's definitely chemical. Or when I mixed sugar and sulfuric acid for you guys and that big black snake thing came out, um, that was definitely chemical because, I mean, think about it. It started out as white sugar and then it was sulfuric acid and it just out came this black smoky stuff and heat was released. Holy cow, that was a chemical change. Um, and so I think you'll be pretty well in those. You just got to kind of analyze it and, and think about it. Think if something new is actually made. All right, um, next one. And McGuire, this is getting to your question about is there anything from this lab on it? Um, the iodine lab and answer is yes, in a, in a way, in a sense. So the iodine lab, I'm not, it's not like I'm taking information directly from that lab, like your data and putting it on the test, but I'm giving you a scenario just like that, okay? So what you guys did in that lab is you collected a bunch of information. You did a bunch of obs observing of different reactions. You mixed like, I don't know, like 12 different things together. And um, you used that data to predict what the, the unknown substance was. <clears throat> and that unknown substance, guys, um, I'll tell you because you're here, um, which is awesome. But the unknown for that lab was cornstarch and... Um, Gosh, I'm like forgetting now. Cornstarch and baking soda. It was cornstarch and baking soda. And for baking soda and baking powder, when you reacted those with like vinegar, um, the baking soda fizzed like crazy. I mean, it just like shot out of a test tube. But the baking powder kind of fizzed sort of gently. So that wasn't like quite as um, intense. And so that would have been hard to tell between baking soda and baking powder, but you should have been able to tell that it was one of those two. Okay, the iodine and the cornstarch, that one was super obvious. So like if you saw the color change to black or purple, you should have known automatically that there was cornstarch in the unknown. Um, if you said uh, baby powder or 
Um, anything else, then uh, it was incorrect. But yeah, it was cornstarch and baking soda. All right. So anyway, to answer your question, McGuire, um, what I'm going to do probably is give you a set of data, just like what you collected in lab. And it will be a different experiment. Um, but you're going to have to look at that data and analyze it and figure out what an unknown substance is. And now I'll give you like a list of things of, you know, like what that substance, like what happened when I mixed things together with that substance. Like if I mixed an acid in with it or I mixed water or iodine or heated it or something like that. I'll tell you what the, the observations were, but you're going to have to figure out what the identity of, of it is based off of the, the data. Okay. So just like we did in lab where you had to like look at the data and determine what the unknown was, you're going to have to do the same thing on a test. It's just a skill that you're going to have to do. It's not the exact same thing. It's just a skill. All right. And then um, last thing on the study guide, let me just knock this out, and then I'll check Edmodo again really quick, see if there's any more questions. Um, analyze a given mixture, identify physical properties that could be used to separate the components of that mixture, and then determine a procedure that could be used to separate it. OK. So for this one, all right, what you can do is um, let's say I'll just give you guys a couple scenarios, all right? How would you separate um, sand, rocks, and water? Sand, rocks, and water. Think about it, all right? Rocks, usually pretty big, so we could use the property of size or color even, like rocks look different than sand does, and you could just pull the rocks out, no problem, because they're bigger and they look different. But sand and water, that's kind of hard. I mean, technically speaking, you could use the property of density because sand is way more dense than water. Sand is going to sink to the bottom. So you could like let the sand sink using the property of density and then just pour the water out. That'd work. Um, also, you could use the property of size to separate the sand from the water because the water, water molecules are really super tiny. But sand? It's a lot bigger than water. So you could take like any sort of filter or even like a cloth or something, and dump the sand and water into it. The water would come out the bottom because it's small enough to fit through the cloth, but the sand is way too big. It's not gonna actually fit through. So that's how you could separate those two. You could also use the property of boiling point because if you were to like heat it up, the water is gonna boil, but sand is not gonna boil. I mean, if you heat it up to 100, um, sand is just gonna get warm. It's not gonna actually boil or melt or do anything. I think sand probably, I don't know, like sand probably melts at like a thousand something, you know, so not even close. All right, um, another scenario. Oh, and I got something I made for you guys on this one. Actually got two of them, two of them. Okay, two more scenarios coming at you. All right, let's say I took, um, one second. Okay, there we go. I have like eight documents open on my computer, it's awesome. All right, let's say we're taking crude oil, all right? Um, when you make crude oil, you run it through a furnace, and inside crude oil, there's a whole bunch of different things, and these are all the different components that go into it, and they all boil at a different temperature. And so if you were to run it through this tower type thing, and this is what they do in real life, it's kind of cool, uh, they heat it to like 400 degrees Celsius, and then the gases, when it turns into gas, it actually boils and it rises. You guys know how things rise. So um, if the temperature of fuel oil, which I guess boils at 370 degrees Celsius, if it drops below 370 degrees Celsius, it's going to turn from a gas back into a liquid and just fall out. And it falls down into this little tray and gets sucked off. This is pure fuel oil. Um, the rest of the stuff, though, like diesel oil, kerosene, and gasoline, that's to, like still get in gas form because it all boils down here. Like when it when crude oil gets up to 400, everything boils. Like it's all turned into gas, just like you boil a pot of water. It just boils and rises to the top. So um, anyway, but as it goes up to the top here, diesel oil, when it drops below 300 degrees Celsius, it's going to turn back into a liquid and fall back down again. But instead of falling all the way down, it's going to get collected by this tray right here. And so the diesel oil gets separated out. And then um, the other two things will go up to the top, so on and so forth. Kerosene gets separated out right here, and gasoline gets separated out right here. Um, and this is just one kind of life application of how boiling point is used. And we may hit this in a little more detail in a different chapter. Uh, don't worry about it too much. I just wanted to give you a real-life example of how scientists use boiling point to separate things. 
a uh, little bit more, a uh, different one here. Um, let's say you have this rock, okay? And it's 20% aluminum, 60% zinc, and 20% copper. How would you go about separating each of these metals from each other inside this rock? Like what physical property could you use? Can't use size. I mean, they're all together in one rock. Uh, you can't use density because it's all one rock. Uh, you can see that there's different colors. That's good. But like they're all one rock. You can't just like, you know, you can't just like yank out a piece. And so for this one, you would have to use melting point. All right. So melting point, um, I actually put a table down here. I don't expect you to know all the melting points, but I do expect you to just know that different things have different melting points. And so what you would probably end up doing for a situation like this is you would probably just heat this rock up to uh, a certain temperature and probably if i ever gave you a question like this i would give you this data table and just make you apply it all right and so if i said this is 20 percent aluminum you see aluminum right here um it melts at 659 degrees celsius and then zinc zinc is down here it melts at 419 and then copper melts at 1083 so if I were to heat this rock up to 419, what would happen to the zinc? It would melt, all right? And what would happen to the copper? Nothing, all right? At 419, copper would just stay solid. Um, same thing with aluminum. But then after the zinc gets all melted away, you could like kind of just collect all that, put it off to the side, and then heat it up to, I don't know, the next one. You could heat it up to 659. And then that would melt the aluminum, all right? And then all you would be left with at the end, once that's all melted off, would be the cover, all right? And so we can use these properties to our advantage to, to kind of separate things. Okay, so that's everything that I had prepared. Uh, I'm gonna check Edmodo here one more time. All right. Dylan says, I don't remember you talking about solubility or order. Odor, <laughs> order odor in your Educanon video. And you are right, Dylan, I did not, okay? Um, I mentioned them in class. We talked about them when we did that lab where we had to separate, where I gave you that mystery mixture and you had to kind of separate things. I kind of touched on it, but I didn't like mention it in the video. So you are correct. Just look at the, um, just look at the Quizlet vocab and you'll be good to go on that one. But solubility is just a, a substance's um, ability to dissolve, okay? So like some things dissolve in water, really well so you would say they have a really high solubility um, other things do not dissolve well in water like for example pepper okay if you try to dissolve pepper in water it doesn't work okay but if you take sugar and dissolve it in water it dissolves super duper well really well so uh, sugar has a high solubility pepper has a low solubility okay all right uh last call guys any other questions Post them now. I'll forever hold your peace. Awesome. Well, um, thank you guys for watching. Um, as just for a reward for you, I have the test right in front of me. And for watching, I'm gonna give you an answer. I'm serious about this. This is good. Um, okay, so the last question, let's see. Do, 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 do. Let me see which one I want to give you. All right. Uh, the, let's see, number, let's make it an even number. Okay. The number, number 20, the answer is D. Okay. Number 20 is D. Got that? All right. Really appreciate you guys for joining me today um, and for reviewing. I hope you do really well. Um, study the Quizlet stuff, kind of go over things a little bit more, and you'll be. Awesome. All right. Take care, guys. We'll see you tomorrow.